So together as a class, we're going to talk about the term. I'm going to give you the definition, and I'm going to give you an example. And then later in your groups, you're going to generate your own examples, and you're going to find some samples in the poems that we've read. The first word, or the first term of figurative language we're going to talk about is a simile. And when you look at that word, a lot of times students will pr pronounce it simile. Simile. Because it doesn't end with like a Y or a double E. So I need you to remember that that's a hard E on the end, a, a long E. And you say simile. I like to remember this by calling it simile-like. And you're going to understand why in just a minute. The definition of a simile is a comparison. Everything I'm writing on the screen you can copy on your paper. Notice how big my writing is. It's not big giant letters. I kind of wrote small. Your hand might get sore, but hang with me. It's a comparison of two unrelated things using, quote, like or as. So we're going to pick two things. And for this example, I picked some funny ones just because I like to laugh. I chose a bald head and a baby's bottom. A bald head and a baby's bottom. So here's my simile. His head was bald and smooth. as a baby's bottom. His head was bald and smooth as a baby's bottom. And go ahead and underline the word as because that's what makes it a simile. We could replace that word with like. Watch, I'm just going to cover it up and I'm going to say like instead. His head was bald and smooth like a baby's bottom. Either way, it's a simile. So there's my teacher example. There's the definition of simile. Let's move on to metaphor. Metaphor is a lot like a simile, but you don't use the word like or as. So a comparison of two things, or two unrelated things, without all capital all capital letters and underlined with out like or as this is why I sometimes call a simile a simile like so that I remember which one can have like or as in it. Here's a metaphor. Her <coughs> hair, bless you, was flowing golden wheat. Her hair was flowing golden wheat. Now, obviously, her, her hair is not really wheat. But by comparing it to wheat, we can get a visual picture of what color it was, what color her hair was. Can anyone turn this metaphor into a simile? Tristan, loud and clear. Her hair was like flowing gold. Very good. But since we didn't use like in this one, it's a metaphor. Super. Let's go down to imagery. Imagery, imagery is when you use words or sentences that make your mind experience the five senses. So, let's write this down. This is a big one. That's why I gave it a big box. Mm -hmm. Words or sentences that make your mind experience the 
Let's write them. Sight, sound, touch, smell, or taste. In parentheses, five senses. When I was working on this yesterday, I immediately thought of that McDonald's poem. Last week we wrote, read a poem called, You Can't Write a Poem About McDonald's, and that guy used a lot of imagery, a lot of visual things, a lot of smells, a lot of tastes. So I decided to borrow a line out of his poem as my teacher example. He said, the salty odor of sweat filled the air. And since I borrowed this from his poem, I'm going to put his name in there. It was Wallace who was the author. Got to give him credit because I didn't make that one up. The other ones I made up. What other places do you associate with the salty odor of sweat filling the air? What other places come to mind? Gage? Our boys' locker room. Boys' locker room. Okay. What else? Jordan? The gym. The gymnasium. Yeah, particularly when it's packed and busy. Yeah, right? Or like, you know, like an yes, yes. What about the wrestling room? Anybody ever been in there? How about seventh hour on an 85 degree day? We've had a few of those lately, so maybe you've been in a classroom where somebody said Mr. Fry's room in seventh grade. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it's him, because it's always his room that people talk about. But anyway, all right, the salty odor of sweat filled the air. Forgive me, Mr. Fry, if you ever listen to this recording. All right, turn the sheet over. We'll go to the back side. The first term you're going to see is hyperbole. This word ends just like simile with a long E. A lot of people will pronounce this as hyperbole. Nope, it's hyperbole. L, the L-E makes a, a long E sound. So go ahead and make the mark over it so you don't forget. And the note I want, I want you to put a special note on the outside because we're going to play a little game over the next couple of days. We're going to call it the Sheldon effect. Bless his heart, Mr. Shelton has a very serious addiction to hyperbole. He loves to use it when he talks. Almost every day he will use hyperbole. Because hyperbole is exaggeration. Like if he gives a test, and it goes really bad, he'll walk in my room and say, Mrs. Hinden, every single student failed my test. I'm like, well, what's what? Wait a minute. He got a C. He got a B. She got an A. He's like, yeah, 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 but look at all the E's. I'm like, well, that's not every student, right? Parents love hyperbole, too. Like, if you forget to close the door, they'll say, you always leave the door open. The hyperbole is because they said always. You don't always leave the door open. You might frequently leave the door open. But when they're mad, they like to make it every single time, right? So if you can catch Mr. Shelton in the next 24 hours using some hyperbole, and it's got to be real, call him on it, raise your hand and go, is that hyperbole? If you can catch him and it was legit hyperbole, I'll give you a prize. He'll tell me. He'll be like, Dale caught me in, in whatever hour. He'll tell me. So if you can catch him in an exaggeration, do it. Because he does it all the time. And I always call him on it. Always call him on it. So, so hyperbole is the shout and the fact. It's exaggeration. The best example I could come up to provide you was that backpack. weighs a ton. It's got to be hyperbole. There has never been a backpack constructed that could legitimately hold a ton. 
So it is it is impossible for a backpack to hold a ton. But we say this, like maybe you got a lot of homework, maybe you're spending the weekend at your friend's house, maybe you got all your gym stuff, put a bottle of water and some snacks, you're like, hey, this thing weighs a ton. No, it doesn't. That's hyperbole. Okay. All right. The next one is, oh, raise your hand if you know how to say it. Oh, I know. Onomatopoeia. It's kind of fun to say. Onomatopoeia. And it almost looks like Pawaya, but it's not. It's Pia. Onomatopoeia. It is a really popular term with elementary kids. Onomatopoeia. Because onomatopoeia are words that when sound, said, sound like the word they describe. Let's write that down so you can think about it. Words that when said sound oops, like the word they describe. Anybody ever watch an old Batman on TV land? Back in the 60s, they weren't allowed to show very much violence on TV. So whenever Batman got in a fight, they would use onomatopoeia. And they would blur him out, and on the screen, they'd put pow, wham, zap. And I'm just going to add vroom, because I like things that go fast. So I'll put vroom in there. But these are all words that sound like the word they describe. Another one is buzz. Jordan? Those are kind of things that you kind of see, like mostly in comics. Yeah. And they're also, and as far as poetry goes, they're really common in kids' poetry. Like Shel Silverstein, you guys probably know him. He uses a lot of onomatopoeia, because little kids love words like that. You know, pop, whiz. Bang, you know, it's just a it's just a little kid thing. So it is going to be really hard to find examples in your poetry collection. Because later today you're going to pull out the red folders and you're going to look for some examples of these. Onomatopoeia is going to be a hard one to find. I will tell you the legend poems, Paul Bunyan, John Henry, you might find some in there because they're kind of childish. I think one of them is even written by Silverstein. And if you have read Out Out, Out Out has some onomatopoeia in it. All right, so anyway, uh, that's what onomatopoeia is. Let's go to the last one, which is personification. And the key to understanding personification is the word person. So if you want to underline person, that'll, that might help you remember. Personification is giving something that is not human. Oops, I misspelled that. Giving something that is not human characteristics that are, all capital underline, human. Giving something that is not human, characteristics that are human. For example, the trees whispered in the breeze. Right. Personification is, is one of those uh, structures that really make a poem a poem. Because if you just want to say the wind was blowing the trees around, that's true. Right now the wind's blowing the trees around. But if you want to say it poetically, all of a sudden you're going to put little tiny voices on those trees. And you're going to say, the trees whispered in the breeze. Now, you and I understand that that's just a fancy way of saying the wind's blowing the trees around, but that's what poems do. Poems use creative ways of looking at normal things. 
You don't say it in a normal way. It's not a poem. So personification is one way you can do that. For the assignment, what are you going to do for the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes? You are going to come up with original examples. So you're going to make up your own. You are allowed to work in, in a team and with your teammates, but everybody can't have the same example. So like if you're, you're working there in your team, you all three need a different example. Mm. Okay? All right. The poem identified example, you might not get all of them. Remember I said onomatopoeia is really hard to find? But you should be able to find the rest of them in your poetry collection. As of yesterday, I think you had 15 or 18. Six, six. I think you had 15 poems in there. I added three more today. So your collection got a little bigger overnight. You've got some more resources you can look through. Um, does anyone have questions? All right. Driver's seat, grab your red folder. Let's get to work.